This is a special analysis of the 2008 election, what happened, how President Obama won the election, and what it might mean for 2012. This analysis is only available to those listeners who have purchased the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics uh, com archive. I do appreciate your purchase of the archive. It helps uh, me to build a library of uh, resources that I use for these podcasts. Saves a few trips to the library for me. Uh, but most importantly, I'm happy that you're listening and enjoying the show. Um, if you have any feedback, I'm happy to hear from you. There's the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics.com website and the Facebook page. The campaign of John McCain 2008 will probably not be remembered in history. Most losing campaigns are not. But yet, losing campaigns have their moments. Walter Mondale in 1984 knocking the great communicator Ronald Reagan off his stride in their first debate. The Herculean train stop tour of William Jennings Bryan, the first candidate to go out and truly hit the road, hit the stump for his campaign, reaching more people than any presidential campaign up until that time, while still losing the election of 1896. Jerry Ford's final surge in the last days, trying to convince voters that he and not Jimmy Carter represented change for America touring with a comedian, trying to look like a regular guy, and tightening up the lead with Carter. John Kerry's turnout surge, which will probably anoint him a place, if not in history, in the political history of campaign operations, is the strongest losing campaign ever. Al Gore's last-minute handshaking in Florida in 2000, up until the very moment polls were closing in that state, which proved to be prescient. Hubert Humphrey's Salt Lake City speech, which defined his campaign and separated him from Lyndon Johnson on the Vietnam War and put him within striking distance of his opponent, Richard Nixon. These are great hurrahs of losing American presidential campaigns that will be forgotten by the public, but remembered by campaign managers, perhaps political historians to come. While McCain lost the election, in fact lost it probably before Election Day, he had one of the best political conventions since these events have been televised in the 1940s, and one of the best VP announcements since presidents and presidential candidates have been choosing their vice presidential running mates starting in the 1940s, in the middle of the 20th century. The odd historic general election of 2008 effectively began in a normal political non-event, the South Dakota primary of early June. When the primary was completed and Hillary Clinton won that state, she lost the nomination of the Democratic Party and Barack Obama spoke to an arena crowd in Minneapolis, the same metro area where Republicans would host their convention in the summer. Obama had waited for after the South Dakota primary out of respect. In an attempt to preempt Obama's great moment, John McCain spoke first at the New Orleans airport in Kenner, Louisiana, not far from where Hurricane Katrina had hit that state, as that was one of the perceived failures of the Bush administration, and John McCain was struggling to separate himself from the unpopular incumbent as best as he could, he felt it was a symbolic place to begin his campaign. In front of an odd-looking green background, John McCain complimented Obama on his skill at making speeches, but said he was not fit to be president and his decisions were wrong. Fresh off the primary wins, Barack Obama's name had by 2007 become just as well known as John McCain, truly, despite the fact that John McCain had been in American politics since 1982 when he was elected to a Senate seat from Arizona. Barack Obama led in the polls. But this story had been seen so many times before where a candidate had led in the polls in the summer and lost in the fall. So a lead in the polls was almost no psychological advantage. Democrats had been beat in the last two elections in 2000 in the Electoral College and in 2004 narrowly in the popular and electoral vote. 
But now Democrats had a four-point lead. And Barack Obama did the best he could to keep it. He picked Joe Biden, a solid vice presidential nominee choice that was celebrated in the media and in Washington, and was to pay off some quiet benefits politically. Biden was well known in the swing state of Pennsylvania, experienced in Washington. In Denver, in a rock concert atmosphere, Barack Obama and Joe Biden accepted the nominations of their party that 100 years ago in the same city would not even let African American delegates attend. The party that had elected its first black congressman only in the 1940s now was giving the nomination to an African American. Of the two major parties that make up American political history, Republicans and Democrats, Republicans got the head start in this area. They elected African-American congressmen and senators in the Reconstruction of the 1860s and 1870s when black politicians were successful in the Republican Party. But the Democratic Party, the party that had been previously the party of the former Confederates, and the Southerners, but had come to change in the 1960s, got to the top of the mountain first, making the first nomination of an African American. Yet the next day, this historic story would be preempted by a move that John McCain made. He announced he would pick Governor Sarah Palin of Alaska as his running mate. The news created a large amount of buzz. Sarah Palin had only been governor of Alaska for 18 months, having earned the office after an election in which the previous incumbent had been accused of wrongdoing. Previous to her election as governor, she had been a councilwoman and mayor of a small town in Alaska. Now she was thrust on the national stage. John McCain also successfully dealt with the problem of George W. Bush at the convention. Would he speak? Would he endorse the nominee, John McCain? He wanted to show some distance from the incumbent. It was decided that the president would speak only from a video screen, using a recent hurricane as an excuse for his absence. This toned down uh, the president's short endorsement of John McCain. And then at the convention in St. Paul, the most anticipated and watched vice presidential nominee speech in history, and it probably will be for some time, it blew through the ratings and eclipsed John McCain, the candidate's own speech at the convention. Most telling is that although Sarah Palin was the second woman nominee for vice president in American political history, Her speech was more watched than the previous uh, woman nominee for vice president, Geraldine Ferraro, whose speech was toned down. McCain had played the one advantage that he got, and in this election, the only advantage he got from being a member of the incumbent president's party. He had the last convention, as the incumbent party does. As effective as the convention that the Democrats had as it was pulled off without a hitch, flawless as it was, All memory of it was erased, and now McCain was up. The media focused on Sarah Palin, Sarah Palin, Sarah Palin. This governor, the evangelist, the hockey mom, the former model, the wife of a union worker, and uh, part Eskimo. A mother, a supporter of gun rights, a caribou hunter and increasingly a celebrity in her own right. McCain was up in the polls, and there seemed to be nothing that Obama could do to erase the McCain lead. The Obama-Biden ticket could not even get airtime. In somewhat of a moment of frustration, Barack Obama told the media that the McCain campaign could put lipstick on a pig, but it was still the same message. Republicans expressed outrage over the comment, says it was an attack on Governor Palin, which Obama denied, saying he was just using an old 
folksy comment, but expressed the frustration of the Obama-Biden campaign that such a statement had to be made just to get news at all. Gradually, though, as Sarah Palin had a few less-than-stellar interviews, the McCain lead shrunk, but it was still a lead. But then, before the presidential debate between McCain and Obama, the economic crisis that had been talked about all through the year in 2008, which several high-profile brokerage houses going out of business, became visible with a large one-day drop in the Dow. McCain, in a move either daring or foolish, said, he would not appear at the first debate. He would go to Washington and try to fix the financial crisis. Barack Obama and the Democrats refused, saying that we had elections during war and that this election should not stop even given the crisis. A bizarre meeting was held in the White House between the incumbent president, House Republicans, House Democrats, House Democrats, and McCain and Obama. A symptom, perhaps, of the first election between two sitting senators ever was that both were powerful members of the federal government and thus had a role to play, had to participate in the government while campaigning to lead it. They couldn't just speak in platitudes about what they would do. And now in this crisis, they were both forced to the White House to appear in this meeting. After the meeting, McCain relented and agreed to go to the debate. The debate was held, and McCain swung at Obama but did little damage. Sarah Palin then did a passing job at the vice presidential debate against a cool Joe Biden, avoiding mistakes, but not really scoring. McCain would not do well in any of the next debates. He would not recover. In the final weeks, the McCain campaign would bring out Joe the Plumber, an average Joe from Ohio who had asked Barack Obama a question about his tax plan, saying that he was going to acquire a plumbing business where he'd make more than 200000 and how would that affect him? This average Joe who was going to be hurt by Obama's tax plan was a interesting and significant tactic to use towards the end of the campaign to try to reverse things in Obama and erode his votes in the people that he was trying to appeal to. It worked in a small measure. As you look at the statistics, some of that white male working vote eroded from Obama and went to McCain, but not in any significant way or in states that would help him. McCain made some achievements. Certainly, Governor Palin attracted attention attention that maybe the McCain campaign in this general election with all the excitement of his opponent wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And given that George Bush had such a large approval rate, such a low approval rating, McCain certainly scored more than President Bush would have if he had been allowed to have a third election. But none of it was enough. Barack Obama won the election. And that is, indeed, the media story of the campaign. Yet, observers watching closely might have noticed something uh, that runs a bit counter to this narrative. Three states, Colorado, Iowa, and Virginia. States that had voted for Bush in 2004 over Kerry. In the case of Colorado and Virginia, overwhelmingly so. Seemed immune to this whole narrative in the media. Throughout the lipstick and the pig and the Joe Plummer and and the Sarah Palin, they seemed to remain in the Democratic column, although they did move up and down in the polls, and maybe on a given day might lean towards McCain. Along with Indiana, North Carolina, Nevada, New Mexico, Florida, and Ohio, and one electoral vote in Nebraska, which allows a split of its electoral votes, these states would leave the Republican fold and be in Obama's winning column. Well, what happened? Was this election really about lipsticks and pigs and celebrities and guns, Tina Fey and Joe the Plumber? Or was something deeper going on? If so, what was it? And what impact will it have on the election in 2012? Let's look at four quick theories that are often thrown about about the election. That Obama won with young people. That he won because of the economy. He won with new voters. And he won because of an African-American turnout surge. And all of these in part are variously true, but some might be a bit overstated. Obama ran in an election against the ghost of George W. Bush, 
evidenced in his record and in the events of 2008. No matter the fact that John McCain, who had been an opponent to George W. Bush in 2000, was the nominee of the Republican Party, Obama was running against George W. Bush. His campaign knew it and brought the point up in most of their commercials. Only 21% of American registered voters agreed with Bush's job performance, was impressed with Bush's job performance. Even in Utah, the most Republican state in the nation, 51% of voters who showed up in 2008 disapproved of Bush's job performance. In the key swing states, the disapproval was much higher. Iowa, 70% disapproved with Bush's performance. Virginia, 72. Colorado, 69. Ohio, 71% of voters were disapproved of Bush's job performance. Considering these horrible stats about the incumbent Republican Party president, John McCain is the Republican Party's nominee, earning 44% of the vote from this type of an electorate. And the fact that he was ever leading in the polls in this race, it's quite an achievement of political campaigning. The combination of Iraq, Hurricane Katrina, the failed Social Security privatization program, the economy, strong partisan opposition to President Bush from Democrats throughout his presidency, left President Bush with little to do in this election to help McCain even if he had chose to do so. In 1968, the entrance of Lyndon Johnson into the campaign, announcing peace talks with North Vietnam, sent shockwaves into the campaign, especially that of Richard Nixon. Reagan's appearances with his Vice President Bush helped to cinch him in. But here, President Bush couldn't help. Iraq was an issue in the background. It was especially a reason to dislike Bush in 2006, when the Iraq War was at its lowest point and Americans were dying, there seemed to be no end to the conflict. It decimated the Republicans in the House. 63% of Americans disagreed with the war in Iraq in 2008, as opposed to 45% when Bush ran for re-election in 2004. Most significantly about the Iraq issue in the 2008 election is, of those who showed up to vote who opposed the war, as recorded in exit polls, Obama won three-fourths of them. But in this 2008 election, only 10% of voters considered the Iraq War the most important issue. Both candidates had made statements which would seem to indicate that the war was winding down a bit, although McCain was not in favor of pulling troops out. The surge had done much to calm American opinion about the war down. And so it just didn't have the place uh, in this election that other issues did. The economy seemed to be more important. In 1992, Paul Begala wrote on a marker board in the campaign office of the Little Rock Clinton Gore campaign, national headquarters. It's the economy, stupid. Since then, that's been the political conventional wisdom about elections. It's the economy. The economy's most important. People vote the pocketbook. You hear this all the time. When the economy rose during Bill Clinton's presidency, and Bill Clinton was re-elected on the back of that economy in 1996, it seemed to reinforce the Begala quote. A strong economy probably helped Gore win his popular vote victory, though not electoral vote li- victory, in 2000. Yet 2000 and 2004 were not centered on the economy in those years. Begala's scribble, to be fair, was never aimed at all elections in history. It wasn't aimed at the world. It was a comment to his campaign staff to help them focus on that year. In 1992, it was the economy stupid. So it's true of some elections and not all of them. Well, 2008 was an economy stupid election. 63% of voters in exit polls rated the economy as their most important issue. So 10% Iraq, 63% the economy. Of those voters, most significantly, Obama won the bulk of them, majority, 53%. 20% 
Two other related issues. 53% doesn't sound like a high number. Two other related issues to the economy, health care and energy. This is, remember, a period of high gas prices. We're rating 9% and 7%. Obama won 73% of voters who said health care was the important issue and 50% of voters who said energy was the most important issues. Republicans had successfully gotten some of the energy voters by appealing to those who wanted to see more drilling. 86% of Ohio voters in exit polls were worried about the economy. 54% of these voted for Obama. 88% of Virginia voters were worried about the economy. 53% voted for Obama. So you see, in the swing states, the economy mattered even more. 63% of the nation, but 86% in Ohio. Demographic changes were important in this election. Shifting, Democra- uh, shifting demographics in certain states turned them from red to blue, to use those conventional colors that I hope at some point will be done using. Nevada, Colorado, Virginia, and Iowa, and others. But two demographics were most important for 2008, and both will be important for 2012. Youth voters is one of the main reasons, so the speculation goes, that we have a 47-year-old president now. And it's true that Obama won voters under age 30 by 66%, a very healthy margin. But under age 30 voters still represented just 18% of the electorate and just a quarter of Obama's vote. Subtract that youth vote and you still get an Obama win. A closer one, but still a win. Barack Obama won the 30 to 44 aged vote and the age 45 to 64 year old vote. These aren't the, well, they might be somewhat of the MTV generation of the past, but they're not the energy, they're not the Pepsi or MTV generation um, of 2008. He did bring new voters in. 11% of voters in 2008 were first time voters. They went for Obama by 69%. So it was not necessarily young voters, but new voters among what we might call Generation X and Baby Boomers, to use these outdated and ambiguous advertising categories for demographics that brought the Obama win. And it's an important group, these new voters, that he'll have to keep motivated for the next election. Another statistical uh, demographic group is is Hispanics. Obama won nearly 66% this vote nationally. And Hispanics in America represent 9% of the vote. While attention focused on a possible turnout surge among African Americans, and that did help Obama perhaps in Virginia, North Carolina, and Indiana, nearly in Missouri, it was this group, the Hispanics, that were highly important throughout the nation, especially on the state level. If you look at Florida, Bush won in 2004 among Hispanics, beating him 56% to 44%. But Obama reversed this, and the Hispanic vote went to him 57 to 43% in Florida. He got uh, the vote of Hispanics 61 to 38% in Colorado, 65% of the Hispanic vote in Virginia, 76% in Nevada, crucial to winning the state, and 69% of New Mexico. Hispanics, crucial to winning the state. Despite losing John McCain's home state of Arizona, he won Hispanics there by more than half. These are the type of statistics that were not available in past historic elections. They weren't, uh, there weren't exit polls conducted. We didn't ask uh, voters what their race was or what their nationality was. We think that farmers put Harry Truman back in the White House in 1948. We don't really know. We, we suspect that women activists in the East encouraging uh, others to vote and those who could vote in the West helped put Woodrow Wilson back in the White House in 1916, but we don't really have evidence of it. We know that uh, Democrats started to lose Southerners after the 1960s, and that's visible in the Electoral College, but we don't have uh, actual uh, statistics. No one measured security moms in 1920, yet Warren Harding won women and 
the message of getting things back to normal certainly helped with this group. 1932 was a it's the economy stupid type of election, but nobody had the quote at that time. Geography has been a factor in American elections, and that's enforced a bit by the Electoral College, and it was a factor in 2008 as much as it was a factor in 1800 or 1796. The American presidential election is an election of states, and we have 51 elections, the 50 states in the District of Columbia. In the American uh, presidential elections from the early part of the 19th century, Democrats had a lock on the South. They could depend on the Southern states and the Electoral College, and if they could pick up a few Northern states, they won. You know, James Buchanan in 1856 had the entire South, and he won Illinois, and he won Pennsylvania, and he won the election. This changed by force after the Civil War, but by 1876, the South was back in the Democratic column. It was a lock. It was a reliable group of votes they could depend on to earn the presidency. Republicans started to counter this by adding new states to the Union, starting with Nevada in the 1864 election and Oregon. Republicans were motivated to add western states in order to combat the Democratic lock on the South. And that was successful in keeping the Democrats out of the White House for some time. Republicans since 1968 have their own lock on the Southern vote. And only Bill Clinton and Jimmy Carter have been able to break into this in various elections, and still not completely. But something else is going on that's visible in probably the past three elections now. While Reagan carried New York, and George Bush Sr. took New Jersey in his own election in 1988, George W. Bush's 2000 win in New Hampshire represented his only win in the Northeast state, and it was the last GOP state uh, in the Northeast. He would lose it in 2004. The Republicans may have a bit of a lock on the South, although Obama's broken into that, uh, but Democrats certainly now have a lock on the Northeast, and that's been visible since the 1992 election. And increasingly, Democrats have an advantage in Rust Belt states like Michigan and Pennsylvania. That geographic advantage alone will help not only Obama in 2012, but Democrats throughout several elections coming up, unless Republicans do something to change. And we know throughout American political history that parties are dynamic. It does appear, at least in the early going, that the conservatives are ruling the GOP party, but Maybe in a few election cycles, that will change. Parties do adapt very much to the situation on the ground. And that's why America has been able to survive through its history with two parties, because they're flexible tents. Obama's real geographic advantage, however, may have been one that hasn't been all that celebrated, and that is the Midwest. He's a Midwestern candidate from Illinois, and he brought home his home state, of course, and also neighbor Indiana and Iowa, as well as Wisconsin and Minnesota, taking these states that had been contested by uh, Bush. In fact, he won in Indiana and Iowa 2004. Just taking them off the table. Michigan was overwhelmingly blue, and Obama won Ohio. With the Northeast, the Midwest, and the West Coast, President Obama had a nice geographic win. He won with various parts of the country, not just one region. The next question that one will look at after seeing how Barack Obama put everything together in 2008 is, what will happen in 2012? Barack Obama's win, in addition to taking over in a crisis and spending a large amount of federal money to stimulate the economy, just something that focuses attention on the president and on Washington, that sort of presages success in the future. Yet anything is possible in American elections. Taft won big in 1908, a hundred years before Obama, just to see his party divided and cough up the White House four years later in 1912. Lyndon Johnson won huge in 64, but his party lost in 68. George Bush Sr. bested Mike Dukakis in 1988, only to lose states that Dukakis had no chance at when he ran for re-election 
1992. In fact, to think after Dukakis's loss that Democrats would ever win Louisiana, Kentucky, uh, and Georgia in the next election might seem to have been crazy, but yet it happened. Things change in American politics. And so anyone looking at McCain's losses and the pretty blue bat map of America right now could always be surprised. Loss of Congress in 2012, for instance. A foreign policy slip-up. Republicans could be completely back in the game. A Republican still starts 2012 with the South solidly red. It's unlikely, though, Democrats are excited about the first non-Bush election there in years, that President Obama will win Texas. It's also unlikely that Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, or the more conservative states like Idaho, Wyoming, Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma, and Utah will go for the Dems. It also seems that Barack Obama has a bit of a problem in some of the Appalachian states, Kentucky, uh, West Virginia, just doesn't seem to be able to win there and underperformed carry in those states. 270 votes is what a candidate needs in American politics, and most of the time, presidents are re-elected. Something like three-fourths of American presidents get elected, even ones that they grumbled about, like Wilson, Truman, and George W. Bush still got re-elected. So there's an advantage for incumbents there. Statewise, the grand old party would be smart to go over to the fringes of Obama's win, and I believe they will. Indiana and North Carolina will certainly be targets. They're not going to allow those states to be held by Democrats without a fight. Then Virginia, Florida, Ohio, Colorado, the one congressional district electoral vote that Obama won uh, in, in Omaha, Nebraska. Do that, and the GOP sends the election to the House if you win those states. Who wins that depends on how 2010 goes and a lot of politics. So, Americans cannot win without, in my opinion, without getting into the Hispanic vote in America. Bush got over 40%. A silent advantage of his presidential years was his support for a Republican among Hispanics. He took Nevada and Florida off the table. Without winning Hispanics, the Grand Old Party cannot beat President Obama in 2012. Given the conservative bent of the Grand Old Party right now and the proclivity of activists towards anti-immigration stances, it doesn't seem like the Republicans are going to do great in that area. The Republican Party should look at its moderates. You know, you look at a fellow like Schwarzenegger, now he can't serve, but there's always a possibility of an amendment, I suppose, to the Constitution to allow him to if he's that popular. Um, Or Charlie Crist of Florida. The trouble is, it's the conservatives that are leading the party, Mitch McConnell, for instance, Rush Limbaugh, Michael Steele, and the Moderates like Charlie Crist and Olympia Snow are siding with uh, Obama, at least on the stimulus plans and his plans to address the economy. One weakness of President Obama is with seniors. This is the one age demographic group he lost. He lost them uh, over 65 voters, 45 to 53 percent. Kerry was tighter with this group, 47 to 52. These groups vote higher in midterms, higher levels, which is a problem for 2010. Independents are also a group that he'll have to keep and that are less glued to him as the Democratic voters are. Obama's other weaknesses are with white non-college voters. Obama did a little better with these guys 41% nationally and 44% in Ohio. A little better than Kerry did, but this would be a group that uh, Republicans would start a base from. We've gone over how Barack Obama won the 2008 election, or really how America selected Barack Obama over John McCain. 
We've looked at various age, nationality, and geography-based uh, voting groups and how they might play in 2012. But it is future events that we don't know right now that will determine the outcome for 2012. What is clear is that the President Barack Obama starts with a huge advantage. But as we saw in the 2008 election, there's always disrupting moves that can be made by opponents, if they're smart, that can help to throw the advantage off base. It can help to reverse that disadvantage. No one who watches American political history should ever write a party off. That's impossible. If it didn't happen in the 1930s with the Republicans, it's not going to happen now. Still, as the Republicans continue to be led by their more conservative elements, they get farther and farther away from the prize, in my opinion, especially with analysis and analyzing what happened in 2008. That's as much as it can be said, though, with the statistics available. The rest is up to future events. With History Beating Up Politics, I'm Bruce Carlson.